um, years ago, and this is probably the, actually the last time that I worshiped with my hometown church, the invitation was given and we all stood up to sing. And you know how it is when you, when you stand up to sing on display for everybody behind you in your pew is the stuff around you. You know, it's car keys and for your parents, it's Cheerios and purses and drugstore readers and, and Bibles and stuff. And uh, as many of you know, I come from a, a very, very small farming community uh, in North Texas. And um, the guy behind me that day is a commercial farmer, okay? He, he farms sweet potatoes, like a lot of sweet potatoes. And um, we stand up and we sing the song. And um, I, had, I had my Bible with me that day. And it was a new Bible. And it's actually this Bible right here. And um, it looks a little different. It's hardbound. And, it, and at that time, it was, it was new enough to where it had a dust jacket on it, okay? And the guy behind me, we finished the song, and he taps me on the shoulder. And he asked me <laughs> one of the more memorable questions I've ever been asked in my life. He says, Morgan, is that Bible scriptural? God's dead serious. Let that one sink in a little bit, okay? And I had no idea what that guy was talking about. And uh, he... he I guess my confusion registers and he, uh, he points at the, at the dust jacket and says, there, right there. It says that Bible's anointed. That Bible's anointed. And I look down at the dust jacket and what it actually says is the Bible is annotated, which if you have an annotated Bible, uh, an annotated Bible is one that has notes in it. Okay, it has commentary. You might call it a study Bible, okay? And, and I had a good laugh about this, Okay. And I tried to explain, and, um, and he didn't laugh. And he did not seem satisfied with my explanation. Here was a man who was focused intently on doing the right thing for God, as this man saw it. And he was also focused intently on me doing the right thing for God as this man saw it. And I think that little interaction is at the, it, it's, it's the essence of what Romans 14 is about. These little frictions between brothers. Be turning there, Romans 14. So we typically think of that, that chapter as being about Christian unity, and it is that. Uh, Paul begins the chapter this way, verse 1. He says, Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. And in concept, we're talking about unity, but he actually uses another word there. He, uh, he instructs Christians in Rome to accept. You may have welcome, you may have receive, but the current running through that word is one of kindness. And it's as if you were welcoming someone into your home, like into your actual home, to stay. And, and that word, accept, is kind of used as a, as a, a bookend, like this big old and iron, okay, between uh, the, kind of the first part of Romans 14 and almost, almost the middle part of Romans 15. Now remember, the, the chapter divisions were not there in the original text, okay? And, and here's Romans 15 and 7, where he kind of, completes this section, and he ends it this way. Accept one another, then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. And so he starts with acceptance, with welcoming, and he ends with acceptance, welcoming. And you'll recall that this passage is really memorable for uh, its labeling of two different kinds of groups uh, or, or kinds of people, uh, there are specific directions given uh, about and to people that Paul will describe as the weak. And the assumption is that, is that there also is a strong, and he actually gets around to naming them uh, specifically, but it takes him till 15-1 to do that. It takes him a little while. And it's critical, though, to understand what he means by those two labels. Uh, and, and those two terms maybe are not as straightforward as, as 
as we might think. Question for you. What kind of Christian are you? Are you a strong Christian? Or are you weak? And listen, as, I mean, as Americans, I think as people, but as Americans, ooh, we like strong. We like strong leaders. We like strong athletes. We like strong superheroes. And <laughs> I would think just about everybody in here probably identifies themselves, thinks of themselves, feels that they are strong. Or at least stronger than the average bear, right? Uh, and with this many people in here, that cannot be true, right? 100% of the people can't all be above average. You know, it just didn't, it didn't work. But nobody wants to be the weak guy. Nobody wants to be the weak Christian. We have typically thought of strong Christians as being Christians that are very strict. Uh, they are extremely disciplined. They're regimented. And they got a lot of things that they feel real strong about, uh, strongly about doing or not doing because they are Christian. And, and an example of that might be, <laughs> and I probably should stop here and tell you that I know at least some of you, maybe all of you are going to hate the examples I used this morning. Because I'm going to use some examples, and you're going to hate them. And the reason is because we're in Romans 14, and people in Romans 14 are mad as wet hens, okay? So I, I hope we have built up some trust uh, here. I assure you I am not trying to be provocative with these examples, and I believe every one of them is sourced from the text, okay? All right. An example of a strong Christian, how we might see a strong Christian, okay? Think of someone that is a teetotaler, okay? So this is somebody that does not drink alcohol at all, that will not under any circumstances, and it's not like a dietary decision. They're not trying to cut back on their calories. They're not diabetic. They're not allergic. They don't like the taste of it and all, and all that stuff. We're talking about someone who thinks it is wrong to do so. Someone thinks it is a sin. And that kind of Christian, we have typically thought of them being stronger than a Christian that might drink alcohol, okay, for whatever reason. However, <laughs> and we do not like this, but our definitions of who is strong and who is weak, they may not line up exactly with what the Bible's definitions of those are, okay? So, in our text today, and you heard it, in the scripture reading, Paul talks about the weak and, but what, what, weak in what exactly? Are they weak in physical strength? Are they weak in discipline? Are they weak morally? Well, no, we're talking about people that are weak, it says, in faith. And their conscience won't let them do certain things. And there are weak and there are strong in faith. And there's some interesting problems and, and some temptations that go along with being in either of those two buckets. Paul's immediate intent, uh, intent here, though, is to teach these two groups of Christians how to live together and live with each other in unity and not kill each other. And Paul's going to make sure that some of the inevitable friction that happens, that occurs in the church, is not going to detract from, it's not going to break, it's not going to uh, destroy Christian unity. That's what he's after. Okay, so accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. Again, who is this weak person? Well, they're Christian. We know that. It says they have faith. There's nothing in the text to indicate at all that it's not a complete and perfect faith. But it's weak. Y'all ever started a fire, like a campfire or something? I did this yesterday. We, we got a fire pit, uh, and I, I, I'm out there like all the time. And I did it yesterday lighted it up. And if you ever do that without, uh, now that it's below 80 degrees, you know, and uh, I did it yesterday. And if you ever do that, like the old fashioned way, and you don't cheat with like lighter fluid or diesel or something, there's a time in that fire's life when you'll crank it up and it's going just real small, right? That it's fragile. And weak faith is a whole lot like that. It's there in these brothers. It, it's there in these sisters. It's sputtering. It's going along, you know, but it's not really going real good yet. It's not like a big old strong bonfire. You know, like a big fire, you can throw a bucket of water on a big fire and it's going to be fine, right? It hisses and it spits, but it goes. These guys are not like that. 
if you know, you got to watch a little fire, it'll die on you. You'll turn around and it's just, it's out. And weak faith is in the same way, kind of a lot like that. And, and it can be snuffed out real easy by all sorts of things. Even as something as ordinary, as mundane as food. Paul says, don't quarrel over disputable matters. And the idea that you're, is that you're bringing somebody that's weak in faith into the church in order to get them told. We're going we're gonna to debate them and prove them wrong and get them straight and get them told and get them taught on these issues and, 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 and get them fixed. And Paul says, don't do that. Don't do that. He says, instead, welcome them, accept them without any agenda, but certainly not to quarrel over, not to argue over disputable matters. Now, look, we're not saying we can't study the Bible in its entirety. We're not saying we can't look in every little nook and cranny in there and study anything we want. But this is specifically in context. It's talking about people that have been brought in in order to... It's, it's, this is targeted teaching at a, at a targeted group, and you have an agenda. And Paul says, don't do that. What are they arguing over? Well, it says disputable matters. You probably have opinions, maybe. Uh, the meaning of that word originally is, is a reasoning or thought like itself or deliberation. And, um, you know, so you might say that these are issues of, that, that take some reasoning, some thought to figure out, some deliberation to arrive at a right answer, right? Okay, so everybody, everybody in the world comes to Romans 14 and they pat their foot and they say, that's easy. We would never bind, I mean, we would never bind opinions on people. We only bind doctrine on people. That's how we're binding on people. This is easy, right? And, and, and sometimes, though, people get confused as, as to what is an opinion and what is doctrine. And now look, not every issue in the Bible is an opinion. And not every issue is a disputable matter. But there are some risks in this passage. And one of the risks is that we can mistake an opinion for doctrine, and we start binding that on people, okay? And then, and I guess another risk, there are probably more, but uh, we can try to get around also, we can try to get around clear Bible teaching or doctrine by mistaking it for opinion. Or maybe it's not a mistake. Maybe, maybe we kind of, it, it serves our purposes to slap that old opinion sticker on something and say, Psh, you can't judge me, man, that's an opinion. There's some, there's some risks in this section. Hopefully, though, we don't have to come up with our own examples of what he's talking about, at least not at first. Paul will give us some examples of what he means when he says disputable matters, and it is important to start there. We can make all sorts of applications on down the road, but it's important to start in the text. He gives either two or three examples, depending on how you count it. Uh, first example he gives is eating meat or not. And we say, big deal. That sounds dumb. Um, remember, though, we are probably talking about what he is talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, meat sacrifice to idols, okay? You'll remember in antiquity, uh, there is this meat, it's offered for sale. It was probably donated by these temples uh, into the marketplace, and you could go buy it. And the meat was different from just regular meat because it had been used in these temple practices. So think like Zeus, Apollo, that sort of thing. And they had used, maybe they'd sacrificed a cow or something. And they go in and this has been dedicated to Zeus and they chop that thing up and do whatever they're going to do with it. And then they donate it into the meat market. And we actually don't know. The, the line is that it was cheaper. Well, we don't know that. We think it is. But the idea is that maybe you could get some discount meat and you could feed your family. Meat was a lot more rare to have in the ancient world than it is now. And it was super, super controversial to eat this stuff in the early church. Second example he gives. Observing special days. Now, you know, kind of in mar modern parlance, we, we would say holidays. Uh, maybe those are religious, maybe they're not. Are we talking about Jewish new moon festivals and all the feasts, you know, of the Old Testament? Are we thought, uh, talking about something more secular, more pagan even? In, in origin... And then this third example, and he really mentions this only in passing. We won't get to it today. It's in verse 21. He mentions drinking wine. And so incredibly, his specific examples deal with food and drink, 
and holidays, which are basically synonymous with food and drink. And I think that's really interesting because all of those things are, are, are things that touch our lives almost every day, or at least seem like, you know, every month. We just went through a big holiday season. I reckon most of us try to eat and drink every day. Um, and these are, believe it or not, these are all opportunities to strengthen or severely weaken our brothers and sisters in Christ. One person's faith, verse 2, allows them to eat anything. But another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The, the literal on that is greens, but the point is they're not eating meat. What's going on here? Well, <laughs> the early church was a complicated place. You got people, you know, coming to Christ from, from all of these disparate backgrounds. And, and in the places that Paul was evangelizing, you got people that, that were Jewish and they had converted and they, they brought some or all of their customs into the church with them. And, and there were also, right beside them, there's these former dyed-in-the-wool pagans. And you got Italians and, and North Africans and, and Greeks and Judeans. And, and a whole lot more from every corner of the empire, all trying to worship each other. And, and all of these different cultures had different traditions, and we, you know, we do too. Uh, and all of them usually had an acceptable diet that they brought with them. And that's an age-old thing too. And if you start looking for it in the Bible, you start seeing it a lot of places. I thought immediately of, um, you guys remember, uh, was it Genesis 43, where Joseph is this big shot in Egypt, right? And he... Uh, it says there that the Egyptians could not eat with the Hebrews, for that is an abomination to the Egyptians. And so Joseph's brothers don't eat Egyptian kosher. And Joseph does. You know, remember when they serve food? Remember what happens? It's kind of strange. They serve them on different tables. They can't even eat at the same table. Joseph's brothers are over there. Joseph's here. And apparently the Egyptians with Joseph are on another table. It's kind of a weird feast. So, you know, back to Paul's time, these pagan Greeks had sacrificed something to, I don't know, Aphrodite or something. And you're Christian. Can you eat that stuff? And people fought hammer and tong over that. Now, lest we think this is a problem only for, for Bible times, uh, I read recently uh, in majority Muslim countries today, there is this, just about all the, all the meat, if not every bit of meat in that country, whether you buy at the store, like at a butcher or something, or if it's served to you privately, like at a private home, is what's called halal, okay? So halal is to Islam what kosher is to Judaism, okay? So we're talking about ceremonially clean meat, like acceptable meat to eat religiously, okay? And to be halal, uh, meat has to be sacrificed by a Muslim, after invoking Allah's name in a short, specific Islamic prayer. And, and the funny thing is, during this whole thing, as you slaughter it, you've got to orient that animal. You've got to point him toward Mecca. I think it's, it'd be that way. So, you're a Christian. Can you eat halal meat? And if you can, can you at least see how some Christians might not be able to? So, back to the early church here. <laughs> you take all these people from all these crazy backgrounds and you throw them in a blender and you hit the button. And there were problems. There were a lot of problems. We know the ch early church ate together a whole bunch. And so, what happens when, you know, the devout Jew that is converted, he, you know, he posts up in the potluck line and, and he's, he's scooping this brown stuff out on his plate and he slops a little bit of it on its hand, in his hand and, and it, sell, it smells pretty good. And so he licks it off and, and uh, it tastes better than it smells. And the guy behind him pokes him in the, in the ribs and says, man, you're going to love that. That's our favorite recipe around our house. My wife kills with that recipe. We, kill, we, we just eat everything and, and that's the best pork stew you're going to ever have. And the Jewish guy goes white because he's 45 years old and he has never touched a pig. He has never smelled pork cooking. He's never smelled bacon. And to me and you, that's a shame, but you can understand, right? And he cannot believe what he has just done. 
And he sprints out of that place and he goes and gets sick in the bushes outside. And when he comes back in, he's mad. A few people back in the line from him, kind of towards the end of it, is a, a little lady and she is, she is just converted. She's a brand new Christian. And um, she is a former uh, worshiper of Dionysus. So Greek god uh, of a bunch of stuff, theater, uh, wine, winemaking, vineyards, stuff like that, a lot more. And she looks up at the, at the table they're, they're serving everything off of, and there's a, there's, a, there's a big jug of wine on it that somebody has brought and, uh, and donated and, um, for everybody to share, and she starts getting real uncomfortable. Because upon conversion, she promised God that she would not be around that stuff, she wouldn't touch it anymore, she wouldn't have anything to do with it. Because she dropped all that. She left that life when she left that temple cult to follow Christ. And she starts getting real unhappy at the guy who brought it. He's a Jewish vineyard owner. And she starts telling everybody around her that she's real uncomfortable about it. She's not real appreciative. When that guy with the <laughs> that accidentally ate the pork stew comes back in, What's he going to say? And I mean, your guess is as good as mine, but I think he's going to say something along the lines of, well, he's going to give that Greek guy a piece of his mind, and he's going to say, hey man, you never do that to me again. You caused me to sin because you're sinning. God's people, they don't eat pork. That's not acceptable before God. You go look it up. If you keep that pork chop habit up, you're going to burn in hell. And Paul has some teaching for that one, for that Christian. When the, when the vineyard owner, the Jewish vineyard owner, hears that somebody in the back is really unhappy with him about his wine that he brought out of generosity, and it was really good stuff, it's expensive. And what's he, what's he going to say about that? And I reckon he's going to say something to the tune of, look, that dumb pagan... She didn't even know two weeks ago that a marble statue wasn't a real God, like a rock. And she's going to tell me how to live? Are you kidding? God gave me that vineyard, and he gave me that wine, and I'm going to share it to glorify him. And I don't give two rips what that little lady thinks. What is she to me? She's been here 45 minutes, and she wants to tell me how to live. Come on. And Paul has some teaching for him, too. The one, verse 3, who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does. For God has accepted them. The initial teaching is this. To the Weak. Now, this is the one that their conscience won't allow them to do certain things. And these guys have a lot of what we used to call scruples. You guys remember that term? So Paul says to them, to the people weak in faith, don't you judge, don't you pass judgment on, don't you condemn the one that can eat and drink what you can't. Don't you judge your brother and sister. Don't do it. And if you think about it, that is exactly the temptation for somebody that, you know, say just for example, and again, here's another example you're going to hate. Um, Somebody that, that can't celebrate Christmas. I would think that that person would be tempted to judge the Christian that is just all in. You know, they got, I mean, they went just absolute crazy. And they got the lights on the house and you tune into the radio station and, and you know, it annoys the neighbors and, and they got the, the elf on the shelf nonsense and they got the 12 foot tree and the stockings, the whole, I mean, they just go absolutely bananas. To the... To the strong, this is the one that their conscience doesn't really bother them, and they're not doing anything evil, and it's important to point that out. They're not doing anything wrong. In the text, it says that they can eat and drink and celebrate pretty much without any problems at all. And for this strong Christian, he has a command as well. He says, don't treat your, treat your weaker sister or brother with contempt. You may have despised. Don't despise the brother that is hassling you and telling you, you can't eat that. That's wrong. That's sinful. You can't drink that. You're going to go to hell if you do that. 
And if you think about it again, that is exactly the temptation. That's exactly the reaction, natural reaction to uh, criticism from the weak brother. Okay, so yeah, you were just... You were just sitting there and you were minding your own business and you're eating this cheeseburger that's about rare enough to move. You know, it's a really good one. And there's a cold glass of beer on that table. And maybe it's yours. And maybe it's not yours. But either way, your Christian brother saunters by and they do this double take, right? And nothing is said, but you start hearing chatter at church. And it ramps up. And it gets worse. And you decide to wait it out and it gets even worse. And all of a sudden you figure out you have a really big problem. It's a real temptation to despise somebody that calls you on the carpet for something innocent, whatever it is, and you feel hurt and you feel defensive and you are angry. Because somebody out there wants to ch play, you know, church policeman and make sure you get busted for whatever they're offended by. And it is so easy to treat a brother or sister with contempt, to despise them for that. You strong? You a strong Christian? Congratulations, being strong stinks sometimes. How is this sort of thing even possible in the church? How does it get started? And, you know, then and now over into places like Rome, Italy, 2,000 years ago, or, you know, thereabouts, around about Athens, Texas these days. Um, well, I reckon in both of those, again, very natural reactions, judging and treating with contempt. When those happen, it is because people have forgotten, Christians have forgotten two things. Number one, we've forgotten that God has accepted, he has warmly welcomed our brothers and sisters in Christ. And number two, it's because we forgot that we're not the judge. We're not the boss. God has accepted these people and, and we want to shove these people the door. We want to kick these guys out of God's house like we're God's bouncers. Really. Or the people that Christ literally died to purchase we want to treat them like dirt, like they have no value. Are we serious? Do we really want to do that? Verse 4, who are you, Paul asks, to judge someone else's servant? Now that's a sobering question, isn't it? Paul says, <laughs> y'all got a problem. He says, if we do these things, we've forgotten our place. He says, that brother down the street, that, that sister down the street, they are your brother, they are your sister, indeed. But they are not your servant. And you're not their master, you're not their boss. They do have a boss. Who is their boss? God is. God is. He continues, to their own master, servants, stand or fall, and they will stand you may have be upheld. Now, how is that possible, Paul? How will they be upheld? How will they stand? For the Lord is able to make them stand. The Lord will determine who is in and who is not. And that is fine because that's his prerogative. That's for him to do. And hidden right in there, I think right where we really need it to kind of calm everybody down, is this really beautiful, really reassuring phrase. He says the Lord is able to make them stand. And as everybody's jockeying for, for position here in these arguments and they're deciding who's saved and who's not and who's in and who's out, the Bible points out that as servants, we have a direct one-on-one -on -one relationship with our master. And our master gives us assurance. He can save us and he will. He can make us righteous. And he's the only one who can. And he will. So... <laughs> If your faith is, I mean, is it, if it's strong as a bull and you can eat some really weird stuff or some really crazy kind of questionable sources, good for you. He can make you stand. He can uphold you. And he will. And, and if your faith is, is about as big as a little match burning, about that big, and it's not going real good yet, you know, and you got a lot of scruples about what you can and can't do, and you're trying to figure all this out, and you're really freaked out by everything, 
God can make you stand. He can uphold you as well. And that's, man, that's encouraging. I don't know if that's encouraging to y'all. That's incredibly encouraging and uplifting teaching. One person, verse 5, considers one day more sacred than another, and another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. I I grew up uh, around a lot of people that had really, really, really strong opinions and and feelings about holidays, okay? My, uh, some of my mom's people, and I talked to her about this yesterday, but some of my mom's people did not, they wouldn't celebrate birthdays. I mean, no cake, no candles, no gifts, no nothing. No Christmas, no Easter, certainly not a Halloween. I mean, nothing. And if you grew up in the place that I did, in the congregation that I did, uh, (laughs) you had better not lead joy to the world on church singing night. You know what I mean? On Wednesday singing night. Unless it was July... And it was at least, the high for that day was at least north of 110 degrees. Right? And you better not try that stuff in December. And some of you guys, I mean, you're laughing. You know what I'm talking about, right? I'm, and don't even get me started on nativity scenes. Do you have real strong feelings about birthdays and about Christmas? Or, you know, any other holiday that maybe has religious significance? Great. Paul says, whatever you think about that, be fully convinced in your own mind. Don't do something just because somebody else does it. That's sage advice, right? But no, don't not do something or celebrate something just because somebody else passes on it. Whatever you got as your belief, be fully convinced in your own mind. It says literally be satisfied, fully satisfied, fully believe in your own mind. It doesn't say to celebrate. And it doesn't say not to celebrate. Isn't that interesting? He didn't tell you which way to go. It sounds like this might take some thought, maybe some deliberation to arrive at the right answer, doesn't it? The special and the mundane, both those days are both God's. Here he starts taking this whole thing and he takes this big, you know, teaching that he's got and he starts turning it kind of in, in a really neat direction. And these people that have been fighting and they've been arguing, they've been divided and he's going he's gonna to give them some common ground to stand on and he's going to give them, he's, he's going to kind of <laughs> glue them right back together where they're splitting, they're starting to fracture. I love this. Listen to verse 6. He says, whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains, so you're not doing any of that, does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. And all these different things that Christians are choosing to do or not to do, they, they all have something in common, or at least they should. He says, whatever the Christian does, it is done as to God, to the Lord. And also it's done with thankfulness to him. Whatever you're doing or not doing. Everybody's focused on these microscopic issues of food and drink and special days. And Paul kind of has to grab them you know, by the neck and pull them away from that. And kind of pull them and widen out that lens and that broaden that, that perspective and that scope of what he's teaching to where they can see everything, right? For none of us, verse 7, lives for ourselves alone. And none of us dies for ourselves alone whether we're you know whatever we're doing or not doing in our lives if we are in the body of christ we are interconnected and ooh, as americans we do not like that teaching because we're not any good at it how do we live it's not with the way we live how do we live we say get over there and mind your own and i'm going to stay over here and mind my own we're going to be fine right that's how we live so we i paul Kind of, kind of brings about. He's already mentioned this actually in the book earlier, back in verse in uh, chapter twelve of Romans. This is verse five. He says, "So we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. 
And he continues that idea in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and, and he, this is picking up in verse 14, where he will say, Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot were, would say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body. That would not make it any less a part of the body, he says. So, look, you can pretend you're not a, bo- a part of the body. It doesn't make it so. We are a part of one body, and what we do affects the body of Christ. Are you eating and drinking and celebrating to the Lord? Or not? With, thankful- uh, with thankfulness? With thanksgiving? Good. You're doing what you're supposed to do. But Paul turns up the volume on us here. He's going to raise the table stakes and, and, and on us a lot higher in verse 8. And he says, if we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. The Roman church and others are getting entangled in these, these fights about where your ribeye steak came from. And if you could even eat ribeye steak in the first place. And... Paul says, whatever side of that you fall on, every single thing you're doing in your life should be to the Lord, done as if you were doing it in his presence, right in front of him. Because oddly enough, in truth, that is exactly the way we're living. We're doing everything in the world right in front of God's presence, right in front of him. He can see everything we're doing. We just forget sometimes, don't we? We forget. For this very reason, verse 9, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. Now, how can he be our Lord in both life and death? Well, because he mastered, because he conquered both life and death, right? Which is, I mean, I love that. It's a beautiful expression of his, his, his power, Christ's power, and and in his love and of his extreme reach. Remember, it made me think of, um, of David. David's kind of thinking about this same thing a thousand years before Christ is ever born. Remember him in uh, the 139th Psalm? Remember, he asked God, he's, he's, he says, where can I go from your spirit? Like, if I wanted to get away, where would I go? Where can I flee from your presence? And he says, I'd go up to heaven, you're there. And if I somehow could put a sleeping bag on the bottom of the ocean and roll it out and lay down there, I can't get away from you there either. You're there. The coverage is extreme. It is inescapable. And it's really interesting that Paul says the reason that Christ died and was resurrected was so that we belong to him, living or dead. And that's not usually the way we think about that, right? So we think about him saving us and and dying for our sins and all that's true, but we rarely talk in terms of possession and his living and dying and that qualifying us, uh, qualifying him to be our Lord in both life and death. Paul says don't lose focus on what Christ has done for you. Don't you start squabbling over scraps of food. They were literally squabbling over scraps of food on a paper plate. Okay, maybe it wasn't a paper plate. Verse 10 puts a bow on it though. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For all will stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, and he quotes from Isaiah 45, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will acknowledge God. So then, Paul says, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Every knee will bow. Like, that's happening. (laughs) But it's not going to be to me. And it's not going to be to you. We just work here, man. We just work here, man. You'll give account of yourself and nobody else, and I will too, to God. Wrapping this up, um, look, we're all so different. I mean, look around, right? This is, a, this, is a, this is a varied group. We have a lot of different kind of people in here, a lot, of, a lot of different types of people from all kinds of different backgrounds, with all kinds of different thoughts and opinions and stuff. And, and if we wanted to, <laughs> we could divide up and choose up teams and fight it out right here. 
And some of y'all got canes, and I'm worried about you, right? <laughs> in any other context in the world, a group like this, if left to our own devices for long enough, we would all eventually try to kill ourselves with our bare hands. Like, I'd, you guys would come after me, and I'd come after you, and it would just be mayhem. And that's natural. That's completely natural in the world. What is unnatural is to be unified. But we are in this place, in this time, in Christ. And we're extremely blessed to be so, right? By the grace of God. And I think, I've, I've talked to you, a couple of you guys about this, but I think that's for two reasons. Number one, we've been taught the truth of the gospel. We know how we're saved. If you've sat through Ken's Romans class, you know the truth of the gospel. You know how you're saved. By the way, a plug for that, if you haven't, for some reason, sat through that class, I'm going to go past just recommending and saying you should. I beg you. I beg you. Go through that class or one like it. It will change your life. It changed my life in 2012. We know the truth of the gospel and how we're saved. And number two... We are focused and have been singularly focused on glorifying the great God who did all the saving in the first place, in this place, okay? But the day that that knowledge of how we're saved f fades and the day that that focus on glorifying God fizzles out, on that day, so will our unity. God forbid to be continued. Let's stand and sing.